So, hello everyone. I think we can start today. So, as I said, welcome everyone and greetings from Latvia. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Dana and I'm today's host from Association for Construction Industry Digitalization. Today we will hear about heritage beam benefits and education opportunities during pandemic. As a first speaker, we will hear Krishianis Silitskis, the beam manager from State Real Estate. He will share client's opinion on Riga Castle project. Later on, the CEO of ITET, Janis Bertis, will continue. Third speaker is Rodrigo Ferreira from Ziggurat University. If you have questions during the presentation, please use chat. I will bring them up at the end of the presentation during Q&A session. Also, I want to remind that a recorded version of this webinar also will be available. And now I want to ask Christianis to turn on your screen sharing and please take your stage. Hello, Dana. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks. Uh, briefly share the screen. Okay, hope everyone can see it. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, hello, everyone again. Uh, hope that everyone's safe and well in these difficult times. Uh, my name is Christian uh, Siliskis. Uh, I, re I represent uh, State Real Estate, uh, the uh, owner of the uh, site of the Riga Castle. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, how the use of BIM can benefit historic building restoration and reconstruction. In this seminar, we're going to look more closely at the castle of uh, Riga and how different BIM applications can help uh, make decisions for the design team. Um, so uh, briefly about state real estate. Uh, we are the largest real estate portfolio holder in Latvia. Uh, we have more than 450 properties and a bit more than 4,000 uh, plots of land in our, uh, uh, under our supervision. Our task is to preserve and enhance the value of state real estate, uh, as well as the management and development of the real estate in the public interest and provide uh, public clients with the necessary, uh, necessary premises. Uh, currently, uh, at the end of the year 2020, we have 107 project, uh, ongoing projects. Uh, more than one third of them are development projects where uh, public spaces are uh, developed or adapted for public clients. Uh, next, about the Riga Castle. So Riga Castle was built in uh, 1330. Uh, it has been uh, redesigned, uh, re reconstructed and even destroyed and completely rebuilt uh, during this time. Uh, currently, there are ongoing construction works uh, that includes uh, partial uh, reconstruction and renovation of uh, the, the Riga Castle. Uh, the works that are currently being carried out uh, includes uh, some significant uh, some significant changes. Uh, for example, one of the biggest changes that are going uh, to be implemented in the castle is the removal of the chapel floor uh, so that uh, it <clears throat> goes back to the design uh, as it was before 18th century. Uh, another thing is that uh, the castle has been uh, built for more than five, not five, but 600 years and it has settled over the time. Uh, another uh, significant change is that there will be public spaces built in the fifth floor. Uh, so these are quite significant changes uh, that are being made in the, the castle. And uh, to all these changes, uh, for all these changes to be possible, uh, some uh, serious inve investigation and calculations uh, are needed to be done. So to be able to uh, make all these changes, uh, uh, the 
uh, an investigation on the castle uh, should be done. For the removal of the capital floor, uh, it is necessary to gather all the necessary info to understand whether this is possible. Uh, this floor has been built in 18th century and over 200 years, uh, the, the castle has settled and uh, for the removal of the floor, it needs to be understand if this removal uh, can actually be done. Uh, what needs to be done uh, to understand if it's possible? Uh, first of all, the engineer needs to know all the deviations in the building. Uh, most probably this information could be gathered using traditional methods so like uh, with total station and uh, gathering uh, points uh, at specific locations to understand whether there are some deviations or not. In this case, in Riga Castle, we decided to go uh, with the point cloud uh, with, the uh, with the scanning of the cast uh, castle uh, so that we would have a point cloud which would represent all the situation that is present in the Riga castle. So yeah, the first thing that was done was uh, this laser scanning of the castle and uh, from the data gathered, uh, there were further analysis carried out. Uh, one of these analysis that were being carried out is the deviation analysis. Uh, here in the picture, we can see the deviation analysis of the southern facade, uh, where the green color represents the zero plane and the red color represents uh, deviation to the street side for about 30 centimeters. Uh, if we compare it to the traditional methods, like with the total station, uh, <clears throat> like with the total station, what, we, what would we get? It would be a few points that would uh, point out where, what is the deviation. Uh, using laser scanning and uh, BIM, we can see more clearly uh, what is the mm, <clears throat> uh, what is the facades all uh, all points uh, how far have been ha have they uh, deviated from the zero plane and so on. So this gave us more uh, better understanding of the real situations compared to the traditional methods. Uh, these uh, analysis were made for the whole uh, castle, uh, whole castle southern block to understand if these uh, before mentioned uh, changes uh, like removal of the chapel floor, uh, the uh, deviation of the wall and the fifth floor spaces are even possible. Uh, with all this information, engineer was able to carry out calculations uh, more precisely uh, with more uh, informed decisions about what is the real situation and whether these changes in the castle will be possible. Uh, so that is that was the first part to gather the information and to understand what is uh, what is the situation of the castle and uh, how it will affect uh, the further plans. So the next thing that was carried out was to develop a 3D model. Uh, the 3D model that could be used further in the design uh, for the coordination and more precise drawings to be created uh, based on the actual situation in, in the castle. So uh, these, these all things helped uh, to better understand uh, how, how the situation, existing situation impacts the design, uh, how these, these, uh, this information that has been gathered could help in the design process to make uh, better uh, decisions, more informed decisions, and uh, what, what are the existing condition uh, effects on the design. Uh, so briefly, that's about what was the situation and what was done in the analysis part. And further on, uh, here we can see a picture uh, from the current uh, design work that is being carried out by the general contractor uh, and how these models and the information gathered previously is being uh, used for the design of the building, uh, namely uh, Riga Castle. Uh, the design currently is in process. Uh, here we can see that uh, partially all the MEP systems and then and, and, uh, engineering systems are being modeled uh, so that the design can be coordinated uh, and 
uh, leave no uh, mistakes in the uh, <clears throat> construction site uh, if when the construction works are being carried out. Uh, it is known for everyone that the design is cheaper than uh, mistakes in design are cheaper in the beginning uh, than when these mistakes come to uh, the construction site where it can make a uh, significant impact on costs and time. Uh, so uh, briefly about the situation, that is all from my side. Uh, probably would like to give floor to the next speaker, Janis, which will go more into details about the specific tasks and uh, deliverables carried out during this analysis part and uh, can answer questions after after some time uh, when uh, Dana will tell you. So thank you everyone and we'll go forward to the Yanis. Thank you, Krishan. It's great to hear uh, your perspective. So Krishan is uh, from the client side and I will talk more about, more about the technical process of developing the information Krishan mentioned. So my name is Yanis Berkis. Um, I represent uh, my company ITED. So let me switch on my uh, presentation and uh, we can begin. So. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you today more about the technical part of developing the, the uh, models and also uh, uh, the reports regarding the vertical and the horizontal deviation analysis. So our company called ITED, so we are uh, uh, all about BIM. So we try to create value for our clients using uh, the different technologies that uh, that include uh, also developing these information models, but also different IT solutions to basically reduce different project risks, increase efficiency, solve different problems, and of course, grow for everybody. Um, our uh, core services are related to uh, BIM management and consultancy to developing all those standards, employees information requirements, BIM execution plans. Then we're heavily involved in BIM coordination, analyzing uh, these models, uh, managing teams and uh, trying to find some better solutions for the design. And of course, an integral part of our job also is uh, uh, different sorts of modeling. So in this case, kind of BIM, asset information uh, modeling, uh, 2D to 3D, also uh, libraries. So uh, uh, we have uh, experienced uh, more than 50 different BIM projects. Uh, we have been working on different sides, the clients, the architects, the general contractors, and the problems we've solved are, are quite various uh, in different phases of the project in construction and in, in also in maintenance and in design. And we have a, a, a team that is quite experienced, uh, also engineers from different disciplines uh, located in several countries. Uh, so we can uh, uh, help, help the clients in, in different ways. Uh, so today my presentation, uh, uh, in my presentation, I'll talk about the project just a little bit. Christian's already made some introduction. So I'll talk about uh, also the data capture, the information analysis, the modeling, uh, and uh, quality control. And I'll also uh, mention some of the uh, possible uses for heritage BIM models. So uh, Christian has uh, already uh, uh, mentioned a little bit uh, about the, uh, uh, the castle, the project, so um, uh, the project was done in collaboration with CMB and the uh, uh, laser scanning guys uh, from TDS Scanner Shana. And uh, the main uh, goal for this project part was the technical research. And uh, it was done for a uh, part of the castle, not whole castle. Uh, so the Eastern wing of the castle. And so the, the, the main tasks of the project of the procurement involved. Uh, so the technical research, the research done uh, by CMB, the laser scanning done by 3D scanners and all that. And uh, so the vertical and horizontal uh, structural analysis and uh, creation of building information models done by us. So um, surely one of the most important aspects of a BIM project uh, is uh, proper information requirements for the client. So in this case, uh, uh, there were these requirements. So uh, 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 
the requirements were very detailed regarding laser scanning, so there were quite uh, uh, quite thorough requirements uh, for that. And and uh, this is also something important to mention. So if there are uh, usually no requirements for laser scanning, so the results usually aren't quite unpredictable. So in this case, the results were quite predictable. So as for us, for us working with that information was uh, a lot more easier. And uh, uh, regarding BIM, so there were also uh, requirements, uh, for example, regarding precision. So one of that was that uh, the deviation from the point cloud should be uh, between two to three centimeters. And uh, the other one uh, was that uh, a specific design tool, AutoCAD architecture, should be used. I'll talk about it uh, in, in more detail later. So. Um, I'm not going to uh, go in great detail about the uh, data capture process, uh, but the guys from um, uh, the laser scanner guys did a great job by making a very thorough 3D survey of the building. So they even used some uh, mountain climbers to scan the roofs of the building. And uh, they also um, uh, did some additional work. Uh, for example, they included the three. 160 degree panoramas in the point cloud uh, so we get can get a clear understanding of the surroundings uh, so the point cloud all in all weighed approximately 70 gigabytes uh, so to work with it more efficiently it was uh, subdivided into levels and also the facade was a separate point cloud um, an additional bonus uh, we uh, used and the client received was a photogrammetric model, uh, which again proved uh, very useful in the later processes uh, to understand the building uh, complexity. Um, uh, surely uh, one of the uh, big benefits of using 3D surveying is that you can uh, basically do a section in any of uh, any place of the building, so uh, it's it's not I think doable in, in with in, with any other uh, technology, and this then allows not only to understand uh, the building better, to get a context of the surrounding, but also uh, it allows uh, for technical analysis. Um, um, so one of our tasks was to do a report on a vertical and horizontal structure deviations for the structural engineer. To make their uh, so they could make their decisions on how to uh, uh, how maybe the building could be used in future. So um, uh, we have done this uh, several times, and, and from our experience, it is uh, crucial to do to do the work hand in hand with the structural engineer uh, to give them the data they need because there are multiple ways to create these reports, and uh, so doing this in isolation would. Uh, usually doesn't uh, end very well. Uh, and uh, so, as, as I mentioned previously, the federated point clouds allowed sectioning anywhere. And in and, and this case, the structural engineer, engineer defined exactly where these sections need to be made, what needs to be analyzed, and then we could uh, get on to work with that data. So, Christian showed a similar uh, picture. I'll talk a little bit more uh, detail about this. So uh, for the analysis uh, uh, in this project, we use two methods. So the first one is seen on the left side. And uh, so uh, this was uh, creating the sections of the point clouds. And uh, then basically we uh, drew a, a simple line in, in, a, tool, in a modeling tool uh, and then analyzed the deviations. So here you can see, uh, for example, that in the basement, so we draw the line from the basement column you can see the situation on the top floor where the column is actually moved quite significantly. This, of course, impacts the uh, load bearing capacity of the building. The same goes the facade. So Krishan's mentioned that the facade is inclined outwards. Here you can also see that the inclination here. So the facade is inclined uh, quite significantly outwards. Um, so uh, this uh, other method on the right side includes uh, so a specialized tool. So we use, used as built for uh, uh, for Revit to analyze the point clouds, and it basically you, you need to have res reference plane, and then the tool anal analyzes the uh, distance from the points to that plane. So um, and the result is uh, is these uh, heat maps that give a very uh, good understanding of the situation of uh, different structures. So uh, here in the next slide, you can see uh, the same analysis on floors. 
and you can see that uh, so th this part of the building it's uh, it's it's on a bit different level but uh, this part uh, on the uh, right side so this is this should be on one level but you can see that on the right side it's it's lower than on the left side so you can imagine if you want you know uh, uh, floors that are uh, the same level uh, then you could you, you should pour a lot of concrete to level them out so um this uh, was regarding the uh, analysis, uh, structural analysis. So um, the next phase of the project was to create the, the building information models uh, aligned to the employees' uh, requirements. So uh, I have to be honest, at the beginning of the project, uh, I looked at it quite skeptical because of the requirements for precision. They were very high and also uh, the tool uh, to do this job, uh, in my, my opinion, was quite inappropriate. But uh, you know, uh, I have a passion for historic buildings. So, uh, well, I, we, we, we with the team decided to go for it, uh, to take the risk and try to figure out how to uh, how to do it. Uh, so, uh, the building itself maybe is not an artistic masterpiece, but it is uh, quite complex, uh, and it's due to the fact that it involves so many eras of different construction techniques. So, in the basement, there is arche archaeological material. And uh, then there are hundreds of years uh, old uh, vaults from Swedish, German, Imperial, Russian rule. And each of these rules involve different techniques. Uh, and of course, uh, the more recent additions of the Soviet Union time and, and the both uh, periods of Latvian independence. So again, uh, different, uh, different uh, construction techniques, different objects. And uh, so how to better approach modeling with these type tolerances uh, software limitations, a different uh, period uh, and large count of objects. So this was something that we needed to address at the uh, very beginning. Uh, so uh, as with, with any project, our team, uh, we start uh, with defining a brief. So gathering all the information available, setting the goals, uh, not only the project goals, but also business goals. So we try to identify all the uh, stakeholders uh, of the project. In this case, for example, architect, uh, the client, and, and the surveyors, etc. structural engineers, of course. So uh, then we gather up a team. Uh, that can do this job and then uh, we define some necessary resources technical resources uh, and 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 of course uh, schedules uh, risk analysis is something that we try to include uh, so looking back uh, some time ago i looked back to, at our projects we have done uh, and uh, uh, i can admit that the most disastrous projects are uh, the scan to bim projects they are uh, because uh, either the miscalculation of the effort needed to create these models, but also uh, related to capturing the uh, client's requirements. So that, because there are different ways to do these models. So it, it, it all uh, uh, evolves around the BIM uses. So why actually and how the models uh, will be used. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and a thing that we have uh, invo uh, also uh, are using is uh, basically stage delivery. So uh, rather than uh, to do the whole work in one go and then send to client and get uh, the, an answer that it's uh, shit and not uh, what they expected, we try to subdivide the projects into smaller bits. So in this project, we decided to propose a test zone. You can see it with a green here. And uh, this test zone then was approved by the client. And uh, then we, we used this test zone to uh, to, to trial different technologies that can be used uh, in the modeling process. So the research took a lot of time, approximately a month. So we analyzed different tools, uh, uh, modeling approaches, the results that we can get. Uh, we also consulted the Milano Technical University and we got some additional consultancy regarding architect uh, architectural tool. Uh, for more experienced users. Well, this then uh, allowed us to clarify the methods and deliverables and get approval from the client on how, to, how we can go on. Uh, so the main modeling tool, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, defined by the client. It was AutoCAD Architectural. So uh, at the beginning of, of the project, I even refused to do this uh, project uh, because of this requirement. But uh, then uh, with discussions with our our team well we we decided to go for it and uh, so we did some testing and we we thought okay this this might be done 
And uh, uh, as I mentioned, the model was subdivided into levels. So we could get, uh, we could involve uh, more team members and we could also um, do a stage delivery to the client, which also improved the process. So, um, uh, at the beginning, we understood that uh, several objects were uh, just simply too complex uh, or even impossible to, uh, or, or just time too time consuming to model uh, using AutoCAD architecture. So uh, discussions with a client and, you, uh, and trialing different technologies. So we decided that uh, meshing uh, could be used for several objects. These were, those were vaults and uh, uh, roof structures and other specific objects like uh, stairs, some some specific stairs and and uh, railings. Uh, so you have to understand in, uh, that in a historic building, uh, basically each object uh, is either a wall or a column is different. So uh, there are no identical objects in the building. Uh, so. Uh, this, of course, uh, pays on, uh, heavily on the on the time needed to model these objects. So, uh, creating these meshes, though it seems that uh, it would be an easier it is an easier approach, actually getting a usable result took us enormous amount of time. So, usually the meshes were were uh, crippled; uh, they were too large; they were impossible to export to a specific format that can then be imported into um, out of an architectural and so on. So, uh, finally, with the help of the surveyors, we got the, the best results using a GeoMagic tool. Uh, though, again, you couldn't just simply uh, use that tool uh, and, uh, and have, uh, have that uh, information then uh, imported into AutoCAD architecture. Uh, we needed to use Rhino uh, to clean up the models, to prepare them for import. So uh, it was, again, quite time consuming. Uh, uh, which, which at the beginning we, th uh, we thought it was uh, it should be quite easy, but again, it, it took uh, uh, a lot of time to prepare these meshes for for the uh, for the insertion into AutoCAD architecture. Um, as with any scan to BIM project, there are different modeling methods, and uh, always some assumptions need to be made. So the question is uh, how to get the fastest, most visually good-looking and, and precise result uh, possible. Uh, as mentioned in the beginning, um, and we need to understand the use cases for the models. So in this case, uh, one of them was BIM coordination, and we know that for coordination, we know don't need that high of uh, accuracy. But anyway, we had also the requirements from client side regarding the precision. So in the picture, you could see uh, that, as I said, each object in the real life is different. And uh, this wall, for example, it's though it's it, it kind of in the design, it, it's uh, most likely straight, but in real life, it it has. Uh, it's the, these deviations. So, of course, uh, uh, we, we try to approximate and get the uh, most precise uh, location of the wall, but still uh, the modeling tool allows us mainly to order model uh, the wall straight. So, uh, as I said, we got an agreement that uh, meshing can be used for very high uh, detailed objects like vaults, uh, but uh, everything else should be used uh, we we uh, we we had to use the AutoCAD architecture and the specific tools, the walls, tools, the column tools, etc., floor tools to get the, the basically the building information model. Um, we uh, uh, one of the integral parts uh, of our of our work is also um, the quality control process. Uh, it is still under development uh, of, uh, internally for our scan to beam projects because we are constantly looking for improvements. Um, because, as I said, uh, the, for these types of buildings, for historic buildings, the quality control is based around each individual object. So you have to look at it from different angles, make sections to get an idea of it is if it is modeled correctly. So uh, we did both uh, the, the quality assurance and control in AutoCAD architecture, and also we use Nav use Navisworks extensively. So walking through the building uh, tens of times, making the sections, uh, then and then uh, finding all the issues. Uh, so uh, uh, as with every BIM tool, uh, these uh, this QC process is uh, quite uh, quite quite. Uh, uh, it takes a lot of time because uh, when you uh, fix some problems, you you find uh, it may affect some objects uh, that are uh, connected to that uh, fixed object. So, 
So you, you think you, you, you have fixed everything, but uh, when you return back, you understand that the model actually has changed and uh, you need to uh, uh, make additional corrections. So we, uh, we, we did hundreds, uh, tens of rounds of these uh, of quality control rounds, uh, fixed hundreds and hundreds of different issues. And even though uh, we did that, of course, uh, we missed something and then uh, it's great that uh, on the client side also there's this quality control and uh, Christian was responsible for that looking at the models uh, saying something that uh, that uh, that bothered him and, and we then uh, fixed it uh, another uh, uh, QC method uh, we utilized in this project was the, the site visit uh, with a client so uh, we went through the building uh, we, we defined some uh, some uh, specific areas that are important for the client. So there were some uh, uh, cracks that needed to be somehow uh, shown in the models and, and etc. And of course, uh, modeling uh, uh, it virtually, you can miss things like the, the small details, especially if you have these uh, thorough requirements regarding precision. So you can miss different things because looking at the point cloud, of course, is not the same as looking at the model in real life. Um, so uh, the deliverables uh, uh, for this project were basically the deviation reports, as I sh showed you, and then uh, the end result was the, uh, the building information model. So in DWG and IFC formats, uh, as you saw, the picture is already used in this construction phase. And uh, well, the main conclusions for the project uh, were that uh, well, client requirements and elasticity to adjust them uh, are, are key to getting a good uh, usable result. In this case, allowing uh, to use the meshing technologies, uh, we could use we could get the uh, higher precision and also uh, uh, do it do it uh, a, a bit more faster. Uh, and also, mm, our our conclusion after this project is that uh, for heritage bin projects, you have to look at. Uh, uh, you have to define the scope based on the amount of individual individual objects you are dealing with in the building. This means that each object basically is modeled separately, as it was in this case. So each wall, even parts of walls, uh, uh, and even roofs were subdivided into uh, uh, objects to get get the the precision required. The same goes for BIM uses, so um, it is uh, significant to understand how the BIM is going to be used. So deviation analysis, for example, or coordination or construction work, uh, uh, coordination, simulation development, etc. So uh, this again uh, pr uh, provides us uh, information uh, how to create the models. So because there are different approaches how to, to create these models. and. Uh, then again, involving the right stakeholders in the process. So uh, getting the client on board uh, at the very beginning, getting the structural engineer to work with us, uh, it was also uh, crucial to um, get a good result. So uh, we missed the deadline slightly, but uh, at the end, I think the client was uh, quite happy with the result. Uh, uh, and and uh, this, of course, uh, you know, uh, taking up this project, we, we heavily underestimated the time needed to create uh, this sort of work. And uh, uh, this is why I want to thank, uh, say thanks to my colleagues, Roberts, and especially Carlis for surviving this uh, epic period in, in our, on our comp company's uh, uh, timeline. Um, to uh, the f some final slides from, from my side is uh, I wanted to, um, point out some BIM uses of these heritage models. Uh, and um, uh, so far, you know, these, these kinds of models, uh, they are great for design teams to get a context about existing buildings, uh, but uh, you can also use them for coordination as Christian showed, adding, adding the, uh, the MEP elements and then analyzing them uh, provides a lot of information and uh, uh, as we have seen in many of our BIM coordination projects that basically uh, not having these uh, uh, existing condi condition models and having a 2D design is something that uh, uh, can, can provide, prove very disastrous. Uh, so very interesting. I have some lines on my screen, don't know by who. Okay, anyway, uh, so uh, 
uh, in my opinion, it doesn't matter uh, the scale of the existing building. So if it's a small building or a large building, but uh, utilizing laser scanning uh, and doing the design in 3D, in my opinion, is a must. So the mistakes we have seen, they're just, uh, you know, they cost too much. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it depends on the BIM uses. So uh, for a larger scale project, there are more, much more maybe uh, viable BIM uses for a smaller case, uh, maybe not. And uh, so another popular BIM use is creating these uh, as-built models. So adjusting the design models to the reality on site and also comparing to information from reality, uh, you know, uh, in this case, also in the Riga Castle, you take off the floor, you see a, a different uh, situation, you can do a laser scan and then compare it to the reality. Um, another thing is that you can, uh, the, the information models can include not only the buildings, but also the surrounding information, the, the topographies, the existing projects, the technical surveys, and even historic data. And this then results. Uh, 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 allowed you to create uh, uh, and, and then maybe an as-built or, or an asset information model. Here in one project, uh, you know, we 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 uh, merged uh, you know different uh, different stages of the project. So you have the IFC for the demolished elements in red, and also you have the design model, uh, and you can compare the situation. This the same goes uh, to the um, to the uh, uh, historic information so you can actually uh, uh, show how the building how the layouts were you know 100 years ago or a thousand years ago whatever and um, uh, another thing that is becoming more and more uh, common is that uh, well you can add any information to the objects uh, so uh, in this case you can see that to this window you can add all the different aspects uh, of the window that is then in installed in construction. But the same uh, is uh, for the historic information. So you could add historic information about the paint from, from the 15th century or anything else that can be useful in either maintenance of the building or just simply ca capturing the, uh, the, the, the history of the building. And uh, yeah, this is becoming more and more popular also with the state property holder and, and their projects. And uh, well, finally, of course, uh, BIM is not only a graphical model and, and the parameters linked to the object, but it's also all the information uh, linked to the project using, for example, common data environment. So you can uh, add links to this common data environment, which uh, holds information about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, as built uh, data, photographs, any other thing that is that can be pro prove useful in 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 the uh, using the building, uh, and something like digital twins, where you can uh, link uh, this information to to real time sensors, also is becoming more and more popular. Uh, so basically, it's an internet of uh, objects uh, rather than things. Okay, from my side, that is it. Uh, I think, I suppose we have some questions. Uh, and, yes, uh, thank you, Yanis, and thank you, Christianis. I will take my part on Q&A session. Uh, yeah, while you were presenting, we had a quite, uh, uh, quite good conversation on our chat section. I want to remind everyone, please keep an eye on chat section Comments because some of the questions are being answered in the chat section due to the uh, timing restrictions. But still, uh, yeah, we have the first question uh, that is being addressed to Christianis. And the question is, what professional discipline has been leading the BIM coordination process on this project? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, another thing is that I didn't clearly get the idea or what's the answer I looked for, but uh, to, to be, to describe how currently the coordination process is being done, so the design, the existing conditions model has been developed and used as a basis for further uh, disciplines to be added uh, to the model. 
currently, as far as I know, uh, they even uh, developed uh, a new existing conditions models in different model in different software, uh, so that they would have uh, easier work with it. As we know, the the specific requirement on AutoCAD architecture came from previously used software from the design team, and it was decided to not to change that during the design of the project. Uh, so currently, the construction team, uh, they are developing uh, all the other disciplines and uh, yeah, they, they developed all the, the existing conditions model from uh, the point cloud again and developed all the other uh, discipline models uh, to coordinate all together. So I hope that this answers the question or if not, please uh, maybe specify a bit more what was the initial like uh, the question was, didn't get quite uh, what was meant by that. Thank you. Thank you, Christianis. Uh, yeah, I will uh, kindly ask you to keep it short, your answers. And the next answer is to Yanis. Uh, could you shortly say what uh, softwares were used for the modeling and how much time did it take? Okay, so uh, specifically for the modeling, uh, AutoCAD architecture was used, then we used uh, GeoMagic uh, for the meshes, uh, Rhino for uh, mesh adjustments, and then the other ones were uh, Navsworks for quality control, and, and uh, yeah, and the AsBuilt for, for Revit plugin, it was for this analysis, and also Revit itself. Uh, and of course, Recap we used for, for uh, 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 looking at the real views and using that information and also the Matterport tours that were available uh, for us from the surveyors. So this is uh, the first one. The second, uh, how much time did it take? So uh, I think the process in total was uh, uh, defined to be like three months. Uh, as I said, uh, it, it took around a month to, to do the research on how to actually uh, approach this project. Uh, so as I said, defining the the debrief and etc and then approximately two months for modeling as i said we i think missed the deadline for a couple of weeks something like that but uh, again the effort was like we worked i don't know uh, we clocked some i don't know how many hundreds of hours for this project uh, it was uh, quite an <laughs> insane period i don't know approximately i think 1000 hours or something like that i don't remember Thank you. The next question is, are there any standards for heritage beam in Latvia? Those developed by state property holder, I think, are the only ones currently uh, available for heritage beam. Uh, I can uh, briefly comment on that. Uh, we actually have uh, another uh, company in Latvia state company that is uh, specifically dealing with the heritage uh, projects. They have uh, their own standard uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding the precision of the scanned objects. Uh, but in this case, we did not use them uh, as, they, as they are too, maybe too precise uh, for our, our use cases. And uh, we developed our own for this project uh, based on previous experience and uh, the information that has been gathered previously. Uh, and that was, that was developed based on the previous experience. Thank you. Uh, so we really are having a lot of questions and uh, we will have time to answer just uh, the last ones, few of them. Uh, yeah, uh, the question is, um sorry those are really long questions okay how much asset data was collected against the model i assume this was one of the driving influences behind the commission how was the client educated regarding their air and how was this communicated through the eair Uh, yeah, uh, so first of all, this, for this project uh, specific, there was certain tasks that needed to be carried out. Uh, for, as for the EIR, uh, no EIR was uh, used in its well-known format. Uh, there was specific requirements uh, in, in short format on few pages defined 
what is the necessary uh, resolution, what is the result, uh, what it should look like. Uh, and basically that was, that was on few pages specification what needed to be done and what should uh, look like, uh, what the result should look like. Uh, as for the AIR, uh, there were no requirements currently for the AIR, AIR uh, as these have been added into the construction procurement and uh, this information will be added during the construction uh, where these models need to be uh, detailed further and uh, developed uh, more than, than it was for this uh, use case uh, presented in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you. And the last question uh, that I'm going to ask, but uh, still feel free to ask your questions because we will try to answer them in chat section and afterwards. What were the main motives to use BIM? I assume it's something that everyone is interested in. Uh, well, the, the answer is uh, quite simple. So first of all, we were facing uh, different uh, problems that needed to be solved, uh, mentioned in the very beginning. So as for these deviation analysis, uh, the construction works that needed to be carried out, uh, these, this information uh, should be carried, uh, carried uh, gathered to carry out analysis and BIM allows us for uh, more precise, uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, more information in general uh, to be gathered, to be used in these kind of analysis. So the BIM was uh, chosen because of uh, the information amount uh, that can be gathered and provide uh, using this technology uh, rather than traditional methods. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janis. Thank you, Christianis. We have to move forward and I would like to uh, welcome the next speaker, Rodrigo Ferreira from Spanish leading university, Ziggurat. Rodrigo, welcome. Okay, Diana. Hello. Hello, everyone. So let me share my screen. Okay. Okay. In a moment, just a minute. Um, okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. So, good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, Dana, for your introduction. And congratulations to Janis and Chris Janis for your presentation. It was very insightful. And thank you for the participation of all the attendees. My name is Rodrigo, and I am representing Zigurat. I'm the account manager for corporate servers. Today, I was invited to present to you a roadmap so you can become a BIM superstar in COVID times. I know that we are living a very difficult time, Maybe some of you was directly impacted for this terrible situation. Maybe some of you lost some familiar or friend. Fortunately, I didn't have lost anybody, but I can feel the sadness and how the situation made us ban, imposing us the social distance, the mask, denying a hug. Moreover, many companies from the ASC industry were affected and a lot of people lost their jobs. Anyway, I am not here to talk about all the consequences of this situation. I'm here to talk about how you can overcome this situation and shine in this darkness. At Zigurat, we have managed to unite industry, technology, and education. For 20 years, we have led the virtual face-to-face -face education, training professionals who back in the day wanted to change the world with our masters. And now in the present moment, instead of the controversial situation we are living, we can say that they did so. We want you to go beyond, so let's go for it. So first of all, I would like to thank you, my partner, Aitet. And I think that this sentence um, represents very well 
what our partnership is about. Definitely, this collaboration is for us to go beyond. The results of this kind of collaborations are really amazing because when leading organizations, partners, excellent service are offered to the industry and great initiatives emerge as this invitation and I'm very thankful for that. And I would like to highlight here the word collaboration because BIN is beyond modeling. BIN is about collaboration. And this is exactly the experience that we propose for our students. And I will talk about it in a few minutes. So next slide. So in Zigurat, we look into the future. Evolution and progress had led us at each step in these 20 years of history. We were founded in 2001, and at that time, we were the first online school around the globe dedicated to train the professionals of the ASC industry. During this time, we have achieved milestones such as launching the first BIN online master degree in the world. We take advantage of this technological revolution to accelerate and catalyze the potential of professionals and organization, aiming higher upward for the top so they can lead and be the reference in their specific sector. So nowadays, Zigurat is more than a technological institute. Zigurat Global Institute of Technology is now a global network that has managed to unite industry and technology with professionals and the best teaching practices. To contribute to the advancement of the ASC sector with a disrupted, advanced and innovative educational model. Since our inception, Zigurat has linked its master degrees to the skills that the market and industry demanded, relying on technology and innovation and the opportunities offered by an increasingly internationalized and global market. In 2012, we expanded to the Hispanic market. In 2015, to the Portuguese market with the programs in Portuguese. And finally, in 2016, we became global with our English master programs. These maps actually want to represent that we have the back of the industry. Our alumni has access to the best certifications in the market, like Autodex and Bentley, just to mention a few. They become members of the leading BIM associations that are referenced worldwide in the BIM implementation, like Brie Academy and CanBIM. And they receive a dual degree, one from Zigurat and the other one from the University of Barcelona, which is one of the best universities in Spain. And of course, they get special prices if they want to complement their service with ITED services in Latvia. Don't worry, Janice, this is just a joke. Something that is not a joke is if you want to enroll a group of managers and technicians in our master programs, ITED as a promoting company can offer you special prices. Okay, so next slide. Okay. Okay, related with our global network, you can see that our students come from all around the world. And this is quite amazing as well, because the professionals that enroll in our master come to improve their skills, to acquire knowledge, but they get actually overwhelmed about the international experience that they live in the master. Till now, we have trained 12,000 professionals. They came from more than 70 nationalities. Each year we enroll more than 1,000 students. And last November, we started 17 new edition of different masters. These numbers, which really are outstanding, represents that we are a polytechnic school, an e-learning institution, very consolidated in the market, and our permanence for so many years has a profound reason to the quality of our programs. So here, here you have our master programs. They have been designed to provide the students with the skills that the sector demands and cover the quintessential to keep up with the digital transition. They are div divided in these three areas, okay, being and construction management, innovation and technology, and urban and smart cities. Both being management programs are designed to convert architects, engineers, and constructors into technological leaders in and BIM managers one related to buildings and the other related to infrastructures. Moreover, this year we will launch the first edition of a master that is already a success in Spanish, the Global Master in Construction Project Management, which will follow the guidelines of the PMI, which stands for the Project Management Institute. Then we have our most innovative and technological proposal, 
They are not directly they are not directly related to the construction sector, but both proposals are connected with the digitalization era, and sooner or later they may impact our business. At the Global Master in Blockchain Technology, the students will develop a blockchain application or a business model based on this technology. The MBA in Digital Business has been designed for professionals who want to foster their technological and decision-making skills and add a different value to increase their competitiveness in the global market. And we will launch this year also a Global Master in IoT. And this program will provide students with the ability to develop an entire IoT project from its conception to the analysis of its performance. And the Master in Smart City Management is designed within the framework of the Smart City concept and aligned with the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Devel Development. The final master thesis in this program will consist of the development of a Smart City project applicable to some urban transformation process. So let's talk about our Master in Global Being Management. Okay, this Master in Global Being Management presents a genuine experience and helps the students to gain a global vision. The program encourages collaborative work with counterparts in different geographical areas. Each project group of five to six will collaboratively through a being serving in a project management platform, enriching this way the general experience and encouraging professional development within an increasingly competitive global market. The master have a duration of one year. We have 60 credits and we have two start dates in May and in November. And the method of the delivery is 100% online, synchronous with face-to-face -face live virtual classes. Okay, regarding our Ziggurat ecosystem. Basically, it's aimed to give a holistic experience to all the professionals that choose our master programs. And here is where we really differentiate from other schools. Here is what our uh, is where our quality and value stand out. Zigurat offers trainings that link academic knowledge with professional requirements. We use the number one platform where the students can find everything they need anytime and anywhere to empower their learning process. Regarding our faculty board is formed by international experts who hold leading roles in the in their area of specialization. They are direct transmitters of the know-how experience. Um, our students work on real projects as well because we want them to be ready to face all kinds of tasks and endeavors. Our objective is to provide practical knowledge and give students a chance to learn by doing while acquiring knowledge through real projects. They will develop the, com the competencies of their professional roles by getting involved in a project with their flows and the workflows, the documentation deliveries, as well as communication of projects. And they experience this multicultural environment that we already talked about it. So here we have uh, the academic context of the, of the master. This is the, the roadmap for you to become a, a BIN superstar. It's a combination of theory and practical knowledge but highlighting this practical knowledge because from the beginning, our students get involved in a real project that will be developed along all the year, which is part of the final master thesis. In the first block, you have an introduction and development of the BIM technology from its methodological perspective based on the application of protocols and standards for the efficient exchange of information through the entire life cycle of the building domain assets using the open bin approach as the main strategy for such goal. From block two to block four, you will go through all the dimension of bin. In the second block, block, you will train the production and integrated management of bin models in the design phase through its creation using one bin authoring modeling tool, Revit or Archicad and many other ones for information management, geometrical and content quality control between disciplines, as well as interoperability practices with tools of structural map or visualization analysis. You will also be training BIM project management with methods such as agile and link management. In block three, 
you will train the production and integrated management of BIM models in the pre-construction and construction phase throughout their creation using a different BIM authoring modeling tool, switching to Revit, Archicad, or Tecla, depending on the tool that you chose in the design phase using open standards as a information exchanging formats and many other platforms, quality control, site management platform, and their connection with the time planning and cost estimation. Here you are going to use and synchro basically in the site management and in the cost estimation presto. Okay? And in the fourth block is actually the fourth block is distributed over the course of the entire program. And this block will provide you with the knowledge of different standards that apply to the building assets management. You will learn how to manage the progress information flows, data drops by using different open standards and native tools, whether in the design phase, in the pre-construction, construction as build operations and maintenance. And in the fifth block, you will learn to analyze organizational environments choose between different strategies depending on organization types, analyze, analyze their interna internal process, IT and human resources, evaluate their sustainability toward the BIN, design the BIN implementation plan, designing BIN training plans as well, pilot project strategy design, as well as metric creation and management for implementation plans validation. So you are, are going to be able to certificate your company with the international standard of ISO 19650. And finally, in the final master thesis, as I already told you, you will participate in a real project simulation based exercise that is carried out using open bean approach. From the very beginning of the master's, working on a final thesis will allow you to apply all the knowledge acquired during the study sessions. The lecturers of each model will also refer to the final thesis as the goal of the exercise that we will propose to you. The final thesis will be delivered in group of five to six students, as I already mentioned, and will align with the training programs approach of multidisciplinary teamwork fulfilling the deliverables for the different stage of a real project, that is the design, construction, and handover, okay? And link with the content is the learning outcomes, okay? The, the first learning outcome is for you to become a BIM manager, specialized in open BIM and interoperability, or the program is focused on an approach of open BIM. Then, is to, for you to learn about the software and the most appropriate methodologies for each phase from the life cycle. The third learning outcome is dedicate yourself to the study specialization that best fits your profile. If it is architecture, structure or facilities. The fourth outcome is to, for you to assume the role of different stakeholders working as a team. You are going to experience this collaboration in, in this final master thesis, then to experience workflow, workflows during the master final thesis through real gamified cases, and finally to take advantage of the benefits of memberships and certifications. And regarding that, that last point, okay, I already mentioned to you, you are going to receive two, a dual degree, okay, one from Zigurat and another one from the University of Barcelona. Um, you are going to get certifications from Autodesk Bentley and you will be able as well to join in the leading associations as a member in Brie Academy, Cambin and SEAT. Okay. This is just an example and after the alumni finish the master they really get very proud because this is an experience that require for them a lot of effort and time but when they finish they are really proud and capable of assuming the challenges that they have in the companies. And this is just an example of posts that these are the alumni made in LinkedIn. Here you can see the, the title of the Zigurat and the certifications that they received. Uh, and another thing that I would like to highlight here is because, and this, and the second one, he thanked a lot all his colleagues because this collaborative way of working in the final master thesis is something that the students actually, they are, they not come here to, they not come to look for our master, 
but they get overwhelmed and surprised about this collaborative, collaborative experience. And finally, and I hope that you are not bored till now, um, I left for the end how we can collaborate with companies in their digitalization, tra digitalization transformation. These are the, the main capabilities that we offer to companies. This is how we can help your company to succeed and stand out from your competitors. We want to help you training your working force and training your teams with top master programs. This is our main objective. In a second stage, after the workforce is trained, we can offer to organize a tailored and customized on-site training for your staff and, and why not in the future to join ventures for public and private tenders. And we can help you as well in the journey for searching talent. Okay, this is another capability that we have. Provide you, providing you with an access to a directory of highly qualified professionals, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Also posting job offers and expanding your business relationships with key agents. And regarding our capability of promotion, we can do a lot for your company as well, like position it in specialized field, fields, disseminating your projects and innovations worldwide, and organizing workshops for professionals and students. Okay. Uh, I'm almost finishing. I'm going to give you my contact information, and if you get, get in contact with us, but before I, I leave in this page, here in Sigurat, we are almost in our 20th anniversary. So I would like to give you as a gift from Sigurat, a video that we prepare and represent a lot who we are, okay? So here we go. Beyond, Masadia, Alem. The language doesn't matter here. Humanity moves forward by overcoming its own limits, looking for a turning point, a lever. You connect, one click. Is it enough for you? You have a clear horizon. That's why you aspire to go beyond. Breaking barriers, projecting, sharing, coming together, realizing yourself. You need to know. Grow, observe, trust, experiment, change. Change the world, your world. And to go beyond. Beyond languages, beyond time, beyond obstacles, beyond your challenges, beyond your dreams. And what awaits in the beyond? Knowledge, inspiration, experience, ideas, attitude, orientation, tools, talent, experience, answers, goals, community, learning, innovation, overcoming, success. If you want to invent the future, reinvent the present. If you want to go beyond, go beyond. Okay, very good. And here is my contact information. Thank you for, for your time. Um, here we are. Okay. okay, thank you, Rodrigo. The applause was really on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't expected. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we also do have a few questions in the chat section. And the first question is, what is the emphasis of hardware for data collection over software for modeling in the academic content? The hardware of data collection. I, I, I could, sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Is the, the hardware for data collection in? Uh, for data collection over software for modeling in the academic content. Maybe we can leave this question for later and the author of the question could uh, describe it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah I don't can... know if, if, I, if I can understand the question. Actually, the, the hardware that you need to do the master, actually we are, we are providing 
all the, the license of the softwares and the requirement for the hardware, it's depending and, and it's linked with the requirement of the softwares. So I don't know if I, I respond the question, but if he's not responded, he can clarify in the, in the chat, of course. Okay. That Okay, uh, let's move forward to the next question and then we will come back. Uh, of course, uh, classical question, what's the annual costs for master program? Okay, the annual cost of the, of the program, it's uh, public information that is in the, uh, page, in the web page of the University of Barcelona is 14,500 euros, okay? But if you enroll via ITED, we can offer you special discounts. And this depends, of course, if, a, if, if a company wants to enroll uh, a group, a team of managers and technicians, we can offer, offer the, to the company, of course, and better prices, okay? Thank you. So uh, the question from the Christopher Kerheval. Uh, we are asking him to ask his question on the microphone. Christopher? Okay, uh, looks like there will be no microphone, but uh, in the chat section, he clarified uh, the question with, uh, are you using scanning and Revit? or other software probably yeah, yeah. for the courses? Yeah, actually um, for the part of the modeling we are using, we give the students the opportunity to choose between Revit and Archicad. Then in the third block, um, they are going to have the opportunity to work with Revit, Archicad or Tecla because our, actually in this master there's, there's a lot of engineers that come to, to study with us. But in the third block, something interesting is that we are going to require to the students so to, to change the, the first software that they use in the design phase. So for example, if in the design phase you use Revit, when you go to the block three, you are going to change the software and then you are going to choose between Graphisoft and Tecla. And we made this because in the real world, in the professional world, the companies doesn't work with just one software. No? So we want to prepare the, the students so they can manage the interoperability and between the programs. Okay? In the block three, they are going to work as well with um, Synchro from Bentley and Presto in the cost estimation. And they are going to use as well Solibri, um, CP and a lot of programs and all the programs, the softwares that they, they are going to use in the, in the master, we are going to provide them the, the license as well. Okay, one of my questions was in the class, are you actually teaching the hands-on use of laser scanning for data collection? Um, that being the source for all of the other software programs that are gonna be used to model the data, um, but what is the emphasis of data collection in your program? Uh, I understand. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Actually, in this program, we are not going to use um, lasers for data collection. Okay. Actually, the final master thesis, the, the real project that the students are going to work will be a real project of a building, but they are going to and make the design, the, the construction from the beginning. Okay, we are we're giving to the students some requirements, simulating our real project, and then they are going to use just Revit, not laser and other technologies to design the building. This is response, this is response your answer? Yes, that does answer my question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you everyone who asked the questions. Uh, as I see for now, we don't have uh, any questions in the chat section, but of course you can always use the contact page and uh, send your questions over the email. Okay, uh, thank you, Rodrigo, again. Uh, 
I will now give a word to the next speaker. The next speaker is the board member of the organization of the organizers of this event of the association. His name is Yanis Kreitz. Yanis, please welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello, Yanis. We can see you. Okay, that's good. Uh, we'll try to uh, share the screen. So can you see this? Uh, yeah, we can see. Slide uh, that I have on the screen. Yes, thank you. Okay. Hello, uh, everyone, once again, and uh, my name is Janis uh, Kreitz. Um, I am a, a board member of uh, the Association for Construction Industry Digitalization uh, here in Latvia, and. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. Based on how many questions we have received uh, so far, we can say that uh, today's topics were very interesting. And uh, uh, once again, uh, thanks uh, to the speakers. For uh, those uh, who don't know us yet, uh, and the Association for Construction Industry Digitalization is a nonprofit, non governmental society that combines over uh, 40 members from the private sector and uh, we promote uh, digitalization uh, as well as uh, BIM implementation into the Latvian construction industry by working closely with the governmental and educational uh, institutions. So, and um, uh, one of our activities are uh, uh, monthly meetups and um, uh, uh, I ask you to join us in our next uh, events and uh, uh, next uh, event will be in February. Uh, uh, again, this will be a monthly meetup and uh, our, one of our speakers will be architect uh, Ivar Krasinski from uh, Edge Architects. Um, then we'll, we'll have a, a meetup in March and in April we will have international BIM conference. Uh, in the first part of the day, uh, we will have a, a conference itself with the presentations uh, uh, from interesting topics and the panel discussion in the second part. Uh, the main theme of the conference, uh, conference is uh, BIM FOPs or uh, BIM disasters, where we encourage uh, speakers uh, to uh, share challenges that uh, BIM implementation brings and uh, how they dealt with them. If you have something, uh, something to share on this topic uh, or you know someone who has, uh, please respond to call for speakers in uh, Facebook uh, or LinkedIn. You can use uh, QR codes uh, that will guide you directly to our um, pages. And uh, last but not least, uh, for those who are not our members yet, uh, we encourage you to join us and uh, support our vision. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today. This was the last presentation today. So see you next month. And please don't forget to follow us on social media and to keep an eye on our activities. Thank you, bye.